Hey YouTube, welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Daniel Kaplan and my mission is to make psychology accessible to all. In today's video, we're gonna talk all about caffeine. Now, in the DSM-5, we see something really interesting. There is a caffeine intoxication. There is a caffeine withdrawal. But what we find is there's no caffeine use disorder. So if you see previous videos, I talk about caffeine, like substance use disorder and all of those, but there's not enough data to suggest that caffeine interferes with daily functioning sufficiently for it to be a psychological disorder. So currently, caffeine use disorder is only for conditions for further study. But we're gonna talk all about the usage of caffeine, uh, the symptoms, what it does to the brain, how it affects the body, and how we can identify intoxication withdrawal. So if you like today's video, hit the, the big thumbs up, like, subscribe, click the notifications tab, and uh, hopefully you learn something new. So here we go. So if we were to talk about drugs, caffeine is by far the most widely used drug on the market worldwide. We estimate about 80% of the world's population consumes caffeine in one form or another, whether it be coffee, right? That's the most common form, but it is also found in tea and Coca-Cola or other cola products, energy drinks, chocolate, and then of course, over-the-counter medications. Now, what we see is, as well is that 99% of the ingested caffeine absorbs uh, and reaches its peak within an hour. So if you're looking for how long to, before you go to work to drink your coffee, give yourself an hour and it will be very widely in the system. Now, caffeine acts as a stimulant, hence the title of the slide. It induces or produces the release of dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and roughly two to three cups of brewed coffee can uh, lead to caffeine intoxication. Now, when I say cups, we're talking about eight ounce cups. And if you were to go to a place like Starbucks, uh, one venti Starbucks coffee would be sufficient due to the potency and the, and the milligrams of caffeine to induce a caffeine intoxication. So we'll, we'll talk about the DSM criteria for caffeine intoxication. And in terms of overdose, it is very hard to overdose on caffeine you would need roughly 10 grams of caffeine, which is equivalent to about 100 cups of coffee. Your body would likely force some physiological response to prevent you from getting there. But in theory, a person could, uh, if they were taking caffeine pills and coffee and drinking soda, a person could in theory get there, but that is not the norm. Even a person who says, yeah, I'll have a venti dark roast, put in four shots of espresso, you're still not even close to that 100 cups of coffee or those uh, 10 grams of caffeine. So it's very hard to overdose. Uh, now, what happens if you miss your coffee, right? So if a person tries to cut back or they stop using uh, caffeine, they'll go through some withdrawal symptoms. And I'm also going to talk about the DSM criteria for withdrawal, but they include things like headaches and depression, anxiety, fatigue. Uh, now, caffeine is fairly safe in terms of overdose, but it does not mean that it cannot impact other aspects of who you are, right? It is a stimulant. And because it's a stimulant, it can create heart irregularities, greater risk for high cholesterol, greater risk for heart attacks. And prenatally, it can be a risk for a miscarriage. So it's not entirely safe. It does have 
its risks as well. So as I said in the introduction to the video, the DSM-5 diagnosis of caffeine use disorder is not yet there. It is only a condition that is left for further study and they'll continue to do the research. And maybe when we get to the DSM-6, it might be included, but as of now, it is not. So the two conditions that are there are intoxication and withdrawal. So let's go through caffeine intoxication. So a person to be considered intoxicated has to have uh, at least 250 milligrams of caffeine. So that is the minimum threshold. More often than not, it's more. Now, I keep bringing up Starbucks. I get no royalties, but I will tell you it is my um, place of preference. So I've done some research. In a grande, that is a 16-ounce cup of Starbucks coffee, there's 330 milligrams of caffeine. So when we said two to three cups of coffee will get you to intoxication, it's clear that in the case of Starbucks, it definitely does. So what are some of the symptoms? Now you may get some, but not all of these, but if we're gonna call this a caffeine intoxication, you need five or more. You need to develop restlessness, nervousness, excitement, insomnia, a flush sense, diuresis, uh, gastrointestinal disturbance, muscle twitch, rambling or increased rate of uh, speech. If you drink too much, uh, tachycardia, right? So the heart beating or racing or an arrhythmia, feelings of inexhaustibility, not feeling tired whatsoever and agitation. Now, this is a lot. Uh, you don't need all of them. You need just about half of them to meet the criteria. And I'm sure if you've ever ingested 250 milligrams of caffeine, you've experienced quite a few of these. Now, the criterion B, they have to cause some level of distress or impairment in social, occupational, or another aspect of one's life. So uh, if you get these symptoms and there's nothing doing, doesn't interfere with your functioning at work, doesn't interfere with uh, your relationships, uh, whether it be peer, romantic, family, et cetera, then we can't give you this diagnosis. And this is probably the hardest part of the caffeine use disorder diagnosis and why it hasn't been added yet is because people argue that caffeine doesn't interfere or impair functioning. It's actually a performance in enhancing drug. So it increases alertness, increases focus, increases productivity in general. So it's harder to get to a point where it's a use disorder. That being said, uh, the research is still coming in. We'll see what happens. And then obviously the symptoms in B cannot be better explained by some other medical condition or some psychological condition. So that's intoxication. Now let's talk about caffeine withdrawal. So in order to get the diagnosis of caffeine withdrawal, a person has to have a prolonged daily use of caffeine and then, and then stop. Abruptly they stop or they try and cut down significantly and then they get three or more of the following features usually within a day. Headache, drowsiness, depressed mood or irritability, flu-like symptoms, inability to concentrate and so forth. And because uh, all disorders have to have some level of distress and dysfunction, there has to be some distress and an interference with uh, performance. So that's criterion C and they cannot be better explained by some other medical or psychological condition. So I know I went through that fairly quickly. That is uh, what we view caffeine in the DSM-5. Uh, I like talking about caffeine because it's counterintuitive. When you think about drugs, you don't necessarily think about caffeine. It's legal, 
over the counter. You don't have to, you know, fight to get it. But yet it does cause intoxication and it does cause withdrawal features. So that's important for people to know. In addition, the fact that it doesn't have a use disorder is what one of the things that make it unique relative to other substances of abuse. So I hope you like this video. I hope you found it meaningful. Uh, if there's anything you want to react, put, put it in the comments below. I read and respond to all comments. So I hope to hear from you. If you have an idea of a video you want to hear from me, put it in the comments. But until next time, everybody, take care.